Today, as we continue the Jonah series, we will get in a boat with Jonah as he sails for Tarshish. We talked about that last week. And as he experiences a storm at sea and a bad case of sin sickness. See what I did there? <laughs> last week, uh, Jonah was running from God. God said, Jonah, go to Nineveh. And Jonah said, no. And he turned around and he went in the opposite direction, got on a boat headed for Tarshish, which is way on the other side of the Mediterranean Sea. Let's reread verses uh, 1 to 3 of the book of Jonah. And this is what it said. The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked its people are. So Jonah got up and went immediately to Nineveh and obeyed the command of the Lord. Uh, Whoops, that's not what it says. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord, as we talked about last week. Futile, but nevertheless, he tried to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket and went on board hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. We said last week that a runner, a runner, a person running from God, is a person who avoids something that God is clearly calling them to do. They consciously choose to ignore the clear commands of God and often do the exact opposite of what they know is right. We talked about what motivates people to run from God, fear, pride, but that's futile, it's pointless, you can't escape from God, so why bother? Why bother fight against his good and perfect will for your life? There's different extremes of running. Uh, there, you can think of maybe people that you know who maybe they grew up in the church and they once served the Lord wholeheartedly and, and now they're, they're, they've rejected it all and they're, they're, run, they're in full out runaway mode. Or maybe there's people in your lives who God is working on. You've been praying for them and they just won't uh, turn to the Lord. They keep turning away when those opportunities come. Uh, so there's different levels of running, but all of us too, all of us to one degree or another, find ourselves running from God from time to time. Whenever we willfully disobey the commands of God, whenever we sin knowing full well that what we're doing is wrong, we are doing the exact same thing that Jonah did. We are running from the Lord in that moment. So Jonah was running, or more accurately, as we'll see in today's scripture, he was sleeping. And then, because of his stubborn refusal to repent, and repentance means turning around and going in a different direction. So so repenting, in Jonah's case, literally stopping and going and heading towards Nineveh. But repentance in our lives is, means where we're going in this direction away from God that is a sinful direction and we repent, we turn, and we go back in the direction that God wants us to go. Um, but because of Jonah's stubborn refusal to repent, he eventually found himself sinking to the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea, literally drowning. So the point of this part two of the Jonah series um, is, is simply this. Sin has consequences. It ain't a complicated sermon today. Sin has consequences. Galatians chapter 6. The Apostle Paul wrote this to the church in Galatia. He said, do not be deceived. Don't fool yourself. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Sin has consequences. Let's finish Jonah chapter 1. We already read the first three verses. Let's go to verse 4, and we'll see where the story takes us next. So he's on the boat on the way to Tarshish, in the opposite direction. But the Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. That's quite a storm. Fearing for their lives, the desperate sailors 
shouted to their gods, lowercase g, gods, for help and threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. But all this time, Jonah was sound asleep down in the hold. So the captain went down after him. How can you sleep at a time like this? He shouted. Get up and pray to your God. Maybe he will pay attention to us and spare our lives. Then the crew cast lots to see which of them had offended the gods. Probably rolling dice or something like that. We're not sure exactly what lots were. Um, To see which of them had offended their gods. They assumed this storm was being caused uh, by, by the powers at B that they believed in, um, uh, caused the terrible storm. When they did this, the lots identified Jonah as the culprit. Why has this awful storm come down on us, they demanded. Who are you? What is your line of work? What country are you from? What is your nationality? Jonah answered, I'm a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. The sailors were terrified when they heard this, for he had already told them he was running away from the Lord. Oh, why did you do it? They groaned. <laughs> you idiot. <laughs> and, since, and since the storm was getting worse all the time, they asked him, well, what should we do to you to stop this storm? Throw me into the sea, Jonah said, and it will become calm again. I know that this terrible storm is all my fault. Instead, the sailors rowed even harder to get the ship to the land, but the stormy sea was too violent for them and they couldn't make it. Then they cried out to the Lord, Jonah's God. Oh, Lord, they pleaded, don't make us die for this man's sin and don't hold us responsible for his death. Oh, Lord, you have sent this storm upon him for your own good reasons. Then the sailors picked up Jonah and threw him into the raging sea, and the storm stopped at once. The sailors were awestruck by the Lord's great power, and they offered him a sacrifice and vowed to serve him. Now, I wish that the chapter ended there because it would leave us hanging, but it says, Now the Lord arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. We're going to talk about that next week. <clears throat> okay, today, today we are considering that sin has consequences, the consequences of sin. We see some of them on display in Jonah's story here. So Jonah's got a bad case of sin sickness. What are some of the symptoms? Well, the first one is this. My sin affects others. My sin affects others. When Jonah got aboard this ship for Tarshish. By doing so, he immediately pulled other people into the orbit of his bad decision. A good name for a hurricane would be Hurricane Jonah because he leaves a path of destruction in his wake. Let's read verse 4 to 6 again. But the Lord hurled a powerful wind, causing this violent storm, fearing for the lives of the desperate sailors, shouted for their gods to help them, and they threw cargo overboard to lighten the ship. They're freaking out. Okay, these sailors, they're terrified, they're tossing stuff overboard. This was an expensive decision for them, right? Probably would have meant that the trip was wasted to some degree because of this loss of, uh, of uh, financial capacity and whatnot. So Jonah might have thought that when, as he was making this decision that this would only affect him. He might have thought, well, you know what? I, I don't want to do this thing that God's called me to do. I'm just going to sneak away and, and it's not going to be a problem But his decision to disobey the command of God had an effect on the people around him. It's like COVID, right? Maybe you don't care about getting COVID. I don't care. I'll get COVID, whatever. But what if you pass it on to your sick grandma, right? You're contagious, bud. You can't do that, right? And it's the same thing with our sin sickness. We might think, oh, it only affects me, but it's never true. Other people always suffer consequences as a result of the decisions that we make to go against the will of God. Your spouse, your family, your coworkers, your friends, even strangers can be negatively impacted by our sin. People will say, well, 
oh, I do this or that, but I'm not hurting anybody. Not true. Not true. Your sin affects other people. Okay, what about the, the next symptom of sin sickness? That is that my sin affects my ability to see clearly, clouds my judgment. Or you could say it makes me oblivious to the obvious. All this is going on above Jonah. And Jonah's down in the cargo hold, sleeping. Someone else had to come along and wake him up. The Bible often uses imagery of walking in sin as walking in darkness. For example, in John's first letter, it says, whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. When you run from God, you are running away from the source of truth and light and wisdom. Think about that. When you're running away from God, when you're choosing to go in the opposite direction of what God wants for you, you are running away from the source of truth, the source of light and guidance and wisdom in your life. So the farther you get away from God, the stupider you're going to get. It should come as no surprise that when you find yourself in that place of having distanced yourself from God spiritually, that you are in a place where you can't think straight, you can't see clearly, it's harder to make good decisions, you continue to spiral downward. And sometimes it takes other people to shake us out of it, to wake us up, to make us aware of what our sin is doing to us and to those around us. That's part of the reason why it's so necessary to have good people around us. People to whom we've given permission to speak into our lives when they see us moving in the wrong direction. People on the outside looking in can see the arc of your story and can make the connections easily between your bad decisions and the chaos and consequences that have resulted from those decisions. It's obvious to everyone around you what you're doing to yourself, the mistakes that you're making, and the consequences of those things, but often you don't see it when you're the one doing it. Because my sin affects my ability to see clearly. My sin affects others. Let's keep reading. Uh, Seven, starting at verse seven. The crews cast lots to see which of them had offended the gods, their false gods, and caused the terrible storm. When they did this, the lots identified Jonah as the culprit. Why has this awful storm come down on us, they demanded. Who are you? What is your line of work? What country are you from? What is your nationality? Who are you? What are you doing here? Jonah answered, I'm a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. The hypocrisy here of Jonah is on full display, isn't it? He says, I worship the Lord. I'm a Hebrew, and I worship Yahweh. I worship the Lord. Really, Jonah? You worship the Lord, do you? If you worship him, why are you disobeying him? Worshiping God doesn't just mean singing to him or praising him or doing other ritual acts of worship. Worshiping God is a lifestyle, and Jonah here is not living that lifestyle. So when Jonah says, oh, I worship God, I worship the one true God, the one who created everything, including the sea that we're on right now, Even the pagan sailors were like, dude, seriously? (laughs) Really? They were terrified when they heard this, for he had already told them he was running away from the Lord. Why did you do it? They groaned. Oh, come on, man. And then finally he admits his guilt. This is not a moment of repentance, by the way. This is just an, an admittance of guilt. And since the storm, verse 11, was getting worse, All the time, they asked him, what should we do to you to stop this storm? Throw me into the sea, Jonah said, and it will become calm again because I know this terrible storm is all my fault. I brought this on. Throw me into the sea. Let me drown. Notice, again, this is not a moment of repentance. Even though he's willing to admit he's guilty, he doesn't pray. He still refuses to repent. It's almost as if he thinks he's beyond saving at this point. He's so set on going his own way, he decides his only way out 
is to essentially commit suicide. So the, the third symptom I want to mention of sin sickness is this, that my sin, when unresolved, leads to death. Sin sickness is fatal if untreated. Does anyone here have a vegetable garden? We've got a few people growing some vegetables. I uh, used to love to grow vegetables. I used to have a vegetable garden and enjoy doing that. And then we moved to Truro. And you may have noticed there's this problem in Truro with deer. And so we don't put a vegetable garden in anymore. It's kind of pointless. But anyone who gardens knows that it's quite a bit of work. Besides the planting, planting, watering, there's also this delightful thing called weeding. And the thing about weeding is that you've got to keep up with the weeding. At least once a week, you've got to go out and pull weeds. Because if you don't, it's going to get out of control. The longer you let them go, the worse it gets. And the less and less you feel like going out and weeding that garden. Because it's gotten out of control. And it feels like a lost cause. It feels hopeless. And eventually, if you never do anything about the weeds in your garden, the weeds will take over and choke the life out of your vegetables. That is a very good illustration of the effect of sin in our lives. And that's, I think, how it felt with Jonah and his sin at this point. It's like Jonah was feeling hopeless about his situation. Hopeless that God would actually forgive him because of just how far he'd gone, because of just how big he'd messed up. He's going, okay, yep, I did this thing, and it was my fault. Throw me into the ocean. (laughs) God's done with me. There's no point in carrying on with this foolishness. And that's how we can start to feel when we are so deep into a sin. Maybe it's an addiction or some attitude struggle we've had for years or whatever it may be, and we start to feel hopeless. But the truth is this. Let's speak truth into that hopeless situation. This is the truth. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. No matter how full of weeds your spiritual garden may have become, one simple and sincere prayer of repentance and God will literally pull every single weed in an instant. He will cleanse us from all, all underlined, bold, italicized, double underlined, all unrighteousness. He does it. He does it. Sin, sickness is fatal if untreated, but praise God, he's given us the treatment. He's given us the cure. Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death. Ugh. True. The wages of sin is death. But, but, big but. The Bible's got some big buts in it. And they're good. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Even when you give up on yourself, God never gives up on you. Do you believe that? Even when you might give up on yourself, God never gives up gives up on you. You might feel like you are beyond repair. You might feel like you have gone too far and sunk too low and messed up too many times this time and thinking, okay, God, obviously I'm just a mess. You don't want to have anything to do with me. You're feeling like Jonah. God, just, I'm just going to throw my, be thrown into the ocean here and let me drown and, and it'll be all over. But that's not how God sees you. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 says, I am sure of this, that I am sure of this, I am convinced of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. He's not done with your story. He still has good plans for you. Now, if you pull all the weeds out of your garden, you pray and God forgives you and you start working on things in your life and and your garden's in good shape, praise God. But unfortunately, that's not the end of the weeds. 
Weeds keep popping up, don't they? Sin is an ongoing problem that we have to deal with, but we don't have to let it get out of hand. Pull the weeds on an ongoing basis. Pull the weeds regularly. Someone said one time when it comes to this and our sin in our lives to keep short accounts. I like that terminology. Keep short accounts. Don't let your sin account grow and grow and grow before you deal with it. You see something going on in your life, you know this is wrong, before you let it get out of control, deal with it, recognize it, confess it, repent, get back on track. God wants you to do that. King David knew a thing or two about seeking and receiving forgiveness, didn't he? He messed up big a few times. Listen to what he wrote in Psalm 32. He says, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. I love that image. When you're you're not living in sin anymore, you can live your life in complete honesty, transparency. There's nothing to hide. It's beautiful. You can be yourself. When I refused to confess my sin, David writes, my body wasted away and I groaned all day long. Day and night your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, finally I confessed all my sins to you and I stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. (laughs) All my guilt is, that's another underline, highlight, bold, italicized. All my guilt is gone. Therefore, let all the godly pray to you while there is still time that they may not, there's this Jonah imagery again, drown in the floodwaters of judgment. We see in Jonah's story here three major consequences or symptoms that we experience when we willfully disobey God. Our sin affects other people. My sin affects our ability to see clearly and think straight. Makes us oblivious to the obvious. We're not acting in wisdom. And my sin, if unresolved, leads to death. But thankfully, there's a cure. Let's finish uh, the chapter and make note of just a couple more things. Uh, Verse 13 is where we left off. Uh, So Jonah says, throw me into into the ocean. But instead, the sailors rowed even harder to get the ship to land. But the stormy sea was too violent for them, and they couldn't make it. And they cried out to the Lord, to Jonah's God. Oh, Lord, they pleaded, don't make us die for this man's sin and don't hold us responsible for his death. Oh, Lord, you have sent the storm upon him for your own good reasons. Then the sailors picked, then they did, they picked up Jonah and threw him into the raging sea and the storm stopped at once and the sailors were awestruck by the Lord's great power and they offered him a sacrifice and vowed to serve him. Here's the first of my last points. I love how God brings good from this bad situation. For these sailors, it was enough to make them into believers. And it has been my experience that even still today, out of situations of catastrophe, failure, and pain, come new experiences of God. Amen? Amen. Has that been your experience too? He shows up. He meets us in the middle of it. And we grow. And in the case of these pagan sailors who didn't worship the true God, they see God for who he is. And they become believers. The second of my last points is this. Jonah should really learn from these sailors. (laughs) Let's compare and contrast for a second. These sailors, not believers initially in the one true God. What do they do? They pray. They turn to their faith, even if it's the wrong faith at the moment. They turn to their faith. Jonah refused to pray. 
What else do they do? They show compassion to their fellow man. They say, Jonah says, throw me into the ocean. Like, no, we're not going to do that yet. We're going to try to row instead of throw, okay? Um, and so they try that. They show compassion. They want to have mercy on this Jonah guy, but in the end they can't. But Jonah, what was, he was willing to suck innocent people into, into, into his destructive plans. Didn't care about, he wasn't thinking about the other, the other people. The sailors, they ask God for forgiveness after they toss Jonah in the water. They did it and they go, oh Lord, forgive us. Jonah doesn't even seem to value his own life. And the sailors worship the Lord after this event. Jonah obviously doesn't. He says he does, but obviously doesn't worship the Lord. It's so interesting how the author here contrasts the kindness of these pagans and the stubbornness of the supposed man of God. Jonah was a Hebrew, a Jew. We know from later on in the story that he thought that made him better than non-Jews. It reminds me of Jesus' story of the Good Samaritan in the New Testament, where the hero of the story is a Samaritan person, a group that was hated by their Jewish neighbors. Good Samaritan was an oxymoron for Jews. How can a Samaritan be good? And that's why Jesus intentionally made the hero of the story, a Samaritan, because part of the point of that story and part of the point of this story of Jonah is for us who think ourselves so smart and righteous because we're part of the right religion that we ought to do some self-reflection and realize that we can be even more boneheaded and cold-hearted than the people who don't know God. These pagan sailors, these non-believers, actually had it figured out better than Jonah. They were more humble, more loving, more spiritual. Interesting. That's going to come up again in Jonah. We see this is a major theme. This is a major reason that God wanted this story told in our scriptures. Because of this very point. All right, worship team, can you come back? We've seen through uh, Jonah's story that sin has consequences for you and for the people around you. But that doesn't have to be the end of the story. God can bring about good from our failures. And we can get back on track with the Lord when we confess our sin and repent. More on that in the next message when we see the Lord rescue Jonah and Jonah finally, finally has a change of heart. Where are you at today? Today? with regards to this. Are you struggling in your life with a sin or with some multiple sins? Is there some area of your life where you're still running from God? Do you have a case of sin sickness in your life right now? I don't want you to have to learn the hard way like Jonah did. If you're struggling with something, now is the time to confess, to repent, Get back on track with the Lord.